Good evening, and welcome to Twilight Tales by Living Well and Wild, a series of fantasy bedtime stories for grown-ups. My name is Alexis, and I will be the narrator for your transition from the busy day to a comfortable and restorative slumber. I invite you to make yourself comfortable as we first settle in to a 2-1 breathing pattern. Practicing the 2-1 breathing technique before sleep can have beneficial effects on overall well-being by promoting relaxation and reducing anxiety. We will start by moving into an even inhale-exhale pattern. Begin with an inhale of four and an exhale of four. Continue this pattern. Inhale four, exhale four. For the next few breaths, inhale four, exhale four. Now, we are going to adjust our breathing to achieve the 2-1 ratio. This simply means that your exhales are going to be twice as long as your inhales. I am going to use a 3-count inhale and 6-count exhale, but I encourage you to use whatever 2-1 pattern you are comfortable with. Inhale 3 Exhale, six. Inhale, three. Exhale, six. Really focus on deepening the exhalation, pushing out all that additional air. Inhale, three. Exhale, six. Take a few moments to settle into these breaths. The King of Elfland's Daughter by Lord Dunsany Chapter 1 The Plan of the Parliament of Earl In their ruddy jackets of leather that reached to their knees, the men of Earl appeared before their lord, the stately white-haired man in his long red room. He leaned in his carven chair and heard their spokesman. And thus their spokesman said, for seven hundred years the chiefs of your race have ruled us well, and their deeds are remembered by the minor minstrels living on yet in their little tinkling songs. And yet the generations stream away, and there is no new thing. What would you? said the Lord. We would be ruled by a magic lord, they said. So be it, said the Lord. It is five hundred years since my people have spoken thus in Parliament, and it shall always be as your Parliament saith. You have spoken, so be it. And he raised his hand and blessed them, and they went. 
they went back to their ancient crafts, to the fitting of iron to the hooves of horses, to working upon leather, to tending flowers, to ministering to the rugged needs of earth. They followed the ancient ways and looked for a new thing. But the old Lord sent a word to his eldest son, bidding him come before him. And very soon the young man stood before him, in that same carven chair from which he had not moved, where light growing late from high windows showed the aged eyes looking far into the future beyond that old Lord's time. And seated there he gave his son his commandment. Go forth, he said, before these days of mine are over, and therefore go in haste, and go from here eastwards and pass the fields we know, till you see the lands that clearly pertain to fairy, and cross their boundary which is made of twilight, and come to that place that is only told of in song. It is far from here, said the young man Alveric. Yes, answered he, it is far. And further still, the young man said, to return, for distances in those fields are not as here. Even so, said his father. What do you bid me do, said the son, when I come to that palace? And his father said, To wed the king of Elfland's daughter. The young man thought of her beauty and crown of ice, and the sweetness that fabulous runes had told was hers. Songs were sung of her on wild hills where tiny strawberries grew, at dusk and by early starlight, and if one sought the singer, no man was there. Sometimes only her name was sung softly, over and over. Her name was Lyrazel. She was a princess of the magic line. The gods had sent their shadows to her christening, and the fairies too would have gone, but that they were frightened to see on their dewy fields the long, dark, moving shadows of the gods, so they stayed hidden in crowds of pale pink anemones, and thence blessed Lyrazel. My people demand a magic lord to rule over them. They have chosen foolishly, the old lord said. And only the dark ones, that show not their faces, know all that this will bring. But we, who see not, follow the ancient custom, and do what our people in their parliament say. It may be some spirit of wisdom they have not known may save them even yet. Go then, with your face turned towards that light that beats from fairyland, and that faintly illumines the dusk between sunset and early stars, and this shall guide you till you come to the frontier and have passed the fields we know. Then he unbuckled a strap and a girdle of leather and gave his huge sword to his son, saying, this that has brought our family down the ages unto this day shall surely guard you always upon your journey, even though you fare beyond the fields we know. And the young man took it, though he knew that no such sword could avail him. Near the castle of Earl there lived a lonely witch on high land near the thunder, which used to roll in summer along the hills. There she dwelt by herself in a narrow cottage of thatch and roamed the high fields alone to gather the thunderbolts. Of these thunderbolts that had no earthly forging were made with suitable runes, such weapons as had to parry unearthly dangers. And alone would roam this witch at certain tides of spring, taking the form of a young girl in her beauty, singing among tall flowers in gardens of Earl. She would go at the hour when hawk moths first passed from bell to bell, and of those few that had seen her was this son of the Lord of Earl. And though it was calamity to love her, though it wrapped men's thoughts away from all things true, yet the beauty of the form that was not hers had lured him to gaze at her with deep young eyes, till, whether flattery or pity moved her, who knows that is mortal? She spared him with whom her arts might well have destroyed, and, changing instantly in that garden there, showed him the rightful form 
of a deadly witch. And even then his eyes did not at once forsake her, and in the moments that his glance still lingered upon that withered shape that haunted the hollyhocks, he had her gratitude that may not be bought, nor one with any charms that Christians know. And she had beckoned to him, and he had followed, and learned from her on her thunder-haunted hill that on the day of need a sword might be made of metals not sprung from earth, with runes along it that would waft away certainly any thrust of earthly sword, and except for three master runes could thwart the weapons of Elfland. As he took his father's sword, the young man thought of the witch. It was scarcely dark in the valley when he left the castle of Earl and went so swiftly up the witch's hill that a dim light lingered yet on its highest heaths when he came near the cottage of the one that he sought and found her burning bones at a fire in the open. To her he said that the day of his need was come, and she bade him gather thunderbolts in her garden, in the soft earth under her cabbages. And there, with eyes that saw every minute more dimly, and fingers that grew accustomed to the thunderbolt's curious surfaces, he found before darkness came down on him seventeen, and these he heaped into a silken kerchief and carried back to the witch. On the grass beside her he laid those strangers to earth. From wonderful spaces they came to her magical garden, shaken by thunder from paths that we cannot tread. And though not in themselves containing magic, were well adapted to carry what magic her runes could give. She laid the thigh bone of a materialist down and turned to those stormy wanderers. She arranged them in one straight row by the side of her fire, and over them then she toppled the burning logs and the embers, prodding them down with the ebon stick that is the scepter of witches, until she had deeply covered those seventeen cousins of earth that had visited us from their ethereal home. She stepped back then from her fire and stretched out her hands and suddenly blasted it with a frightful rune. The flames leapt up in amazement, and what had been but a lonely fire in the night, with no more mystery than pertains to all such fires, flared suddenly into a thing that wanderers feared. As the green flames, stung by her runes, leapt up, and the heat of the fire grew intenser, she stepped backwards further and further, and merely uttered her runes a little louder the further she got from the fire. She bade Alveric pile on logs, dark logs of oak that lay there cumbering the heath. And at once, as he dropped them on, the heat licked them up, and the witch went on pronouncing her louder runes, and the flames danced wild and green. And down in the embers the seventeen, whose paths had once crossed earths when they wandered free, knew heat again as great as they had ever known even on that desperate ride that had brought them here. And when Alvar could no longer come near the fire, and the witch was some yards from it shouting her runes, the magical flames burned all the ashes away, and that portent that flared on the hill as suddenly ceased, leaving only a circle that suddenly glowed on the ground, like the evil pool that glares when thermite has burst. And flat in the glow, all liquid still lay the sword. The witch approached it and paired its edges with a sword that she drew from her thigh. Then she sat down beside it on the earth and sang to it while it cooled. Not like the runes that enraged the flames was the song she sang to the sword. She whose curses had blasted the fire till it shriveled big logs of oak crooned now a melody like a wind in summer blowing from wildwood gardens that no man tended, down valleys loved once by children, now lost to them but for dreams. A song of such memories as lurk and hide among the shadows of oblivion, now flashing from beautiful years, a glimpse of some golden moment, now passing swiftly out of remembrance again, to go back to the shades of oblivion, 
and leaving on the mind those faintest traces of little shining feet which when dimly perceived by us are called regrets. She sang of old summer noons in the time of harebells. She sang on that high, dark heath a song that seemed so full of mornings and evenings, preserved with all their dews by her magical craft from days that had else been lost, that Alveric wondered of each small wandering wing that her fire had lured from the dusk. If this were the ghost of some day lost to man, called up by the force of her song from times that were fairer. And all the while the unearthly metal grew harder, the white liquid stiffened and turned red. The glow of the red dwindled, and as it cooled it narrowed. Little particles came together, little crevices closed, and as they closed they seized the air about them, and with the air they caught the witch's rune and gripped it and held it forever. And so it was it became a magical sword. And little magic there is in English woods, from the time of anemones to the falling of leaves that was not in the sword. And little magic there is in southern downs that only sheep roam over in quiet shepherds that the sword had not too. And there was scent of thyme in it and sight of lilac and the chorus of birds that sing before dawn in April, and the deep, proud splendor of rhododendrons, and the litheness and laughter of streams, and miles and miles of May. And by the time the sword was black, it was all enchanted with magic. Nobody can tell you about that sword all that there is to be told of it. For those that know of those paths of space on which its metals once floated, till Earth caught them one by one as she sailed past on her orbit, have little time to waste on such things as magic, and so cannot tell you how the sword was made. And those who know whence poetry is, and the need that man has for song, or know any one of the fifty branches of magic, have little time to waste on such things as science, and so cannot tell you whence its ingredients came. Enough that it was once beyond our earth, and was now here amongst our mundane stones. That it was once but as those stones, and now had something in it such as soft music has. Let those that can define it. And now the witch drew the black blade forth by the hilt, which was thick and on one side rounded. For she had cut a small groove in the soil below the hilt for this purpose and began to sharpen both sides of the sword by rubbing them with a curious greenish stone, still singing over the sword an eerie song. Alveric watched her in silence, wondering, not counting time. It may have been for moments. It may have been while the stars went far on their courses. Suddenly she was finished. She took up the sword lying on both her hands. She stretched it out curtly to Alveric. He took it, she turned away, and there was a look in her eyes as though she would have kept that sword or kept Alveric. He turned to pour out his thanks, but she was gone. He rapped on the door of the dark house. He called, witch, witch, along the lonely heath, till children heard on far farms and were terrified. Then he turned home, and that was best for him. Chapter 2 Alveric Comes in Sight of the Elfin Mountains To the long chamber, sparsely furnished, high in a tower in which Alveric slept, there came a ray direct from the rising sun. He awoke and remembered at once the magical sword, which made all his awakening joyous. It is natural to feel glad at the thought of a recent gift, but there was also a certain joy in the sword itself, which perhaps could communicate with Alvaric's thoughts all the more easily, just as they had come from Dreamland, which was preeminently the sword's own country. But however it be, all those that have come by a magical sword have always felt that joy while it was still new, clearly 
and unmistakably. He had no farewells to make, but thought it better instantly to obey his father's command than to stay to explain why he took upon his adventure a sword that he deemed to be better than the one his father loved. So he stayed not even to eat, but put food in a wallet and slung over him by a strap a bottle of good new leather, not waiting to fill it for he knew he should meet with streams. And, wearing his father's sword as swords are commonly worn, he slung the other over his back with its rough hilt tied near his shoulder and strode away from the castle and vale of Earl. Of money he took but little, half a handful of copper only, for use in the fields we know. For he knew not what coin or what means of exchange were used on the other side of the frontier of twilight. Now the Vale of Earl is very near to the border beyond which there is none of the fields we know. He climbed the hill and strode over the fields and passed through woods of hazel, and the blue sky shone on him merrily as he went by the way of the fields, and the blue was as bright by his feet when he came to the woods, for it was the time of the bluebells. He ate and filled his water bottle and traveled all day eastwards, and at evening the mountains of fairy came floating into view, the color of pale forget-me-nots. As the sun set behind Alberic, he looked at those pale blue mountains to see with what color their peaks would astonish the evening. But never a tint they took from the setting sun, whose splendor was gilding all the fields we know. Never a wrinkle faded upon their precipices, never a shadow deepened, and Alverick learned that for nothing that happens here is any change in the enchanted lands. He turned his eyes from their serene pale beauty back to the fields we know. And there, with their gables lifting into the sunlight, above deep hedgerows beautiful with spring, he saw the cottages of earthly men. Past them he walked while the beauty of evening grew, with songs of birds, and scents wandering from flowers, and odors that deepened and deepened, and evening decked herself to receive the evening star. But before that star appeared, the young adventurer found the cottage he sought. For, flapping above its doorway, he saw the sign of huge brown hide with outlandish letters in gilt which proclaimed the dweller below to be a worker in leather. An old man came to the door when Alverick knocked, little and bent with age, and he bent more when Alverick named himself. And the young man asked for a scabbard for his sword, yet said not what sword it was. And they both went into the cottage where the old wife was, by her big fire, and the couple did honor to Alverick. The old man then sat down near his thick table, whose surface shone with smoothness wherever it was not pitted by little tools that had drilled through pieces of leather all that man's lifetime and in the times of his father's. And then he laid the sword upon his knees, and wondered at the roughness of hilt and guard, for they were raw, unworked metal, and at the huge width of the sword. And then he screwed up his eyes, and began to think of his trade. And in a while he thought out what must be done. And his wife brought him a fine hide, and he marked out on it two pieces, as wide as the sword, and a bit wider than that. And any questions he asked concerning that wide, bright sword, Alverick somewhat parried, for he wished not to perplex his mind by telling him all that it was. He perplexed that old couple enough a little later when he asked them for lodging for the night. And this they gave him with as many apologies as if it were they that had asked a favor, and gave him a great supper out of their cauldron, in which boiled everything that the old man snared. But nothing that Alverick was able to say prevented them giving up their bed to him and preparing a heap of skins for their own night's rest by the fire. And after their supper, the old men cut out the two wide pieces of leather with a point at the end of each and began to stitch them together on each side. And then Alverick began to ask him of the way, and the old leather worker spoke of north and south and west and even of northeast 
but of east or southeast he never spoke a word. He dwelt near the very edge of the fields we know, yet any hint of anything lying beyond them, he or his wife said nothing. Where Alvaric's journey lay upon the morrow, they seemed to think the world ended. And pondering afterwards, in the bed they gave him, all that the old man had said, Alvaric sometimes marveled at his ignorance, and yet sometimes wondered if it might have been skill by which those two had avoided all the evening any word of anything lying to the east or southeast of their home. He wondered if in his early days the old man might have gone there, but he was unable even to wonder what he had found there if he had gone. Then Alvaric fell asleep, and dreams gave him hints and guesses of the old man's wanderings in fairyland, but gave him no better guides than he had already, and these were the pale blue peaks of the elfin mountains. The old man woke him after he had slept long. When he came to the day room, a bright fire was burning there. His breakfast was ready for him and the scabbard made, which fitted the sword exactly. The old people waited on him silently and took payment for the scabbard, but would not take aught for their hospitality. Silently they watched him rise to go and followed him without a word to the door, and outside it watched him still, clearly hoping that he would turn to the north or west. But when he turned and strode for the elephant mountains, they watched him no more, for their faces never were turned that way. And though they watched him no longer yet, he waved his hands in farewell, for he had a feeling for the cottages and fields of these simple folk, such as they had not for the enchanted lands. He walked in the sparkling morning through scenes familiar from infancy. He saw the ruddy orchis, flowering early, reminding the bluebells they were just past their prime. The small young leaves of the oak were yet a brownish yellow. The new beech leaves shone like brass, where the cuckoo was calling clearly. And a birch tree looked like a wild woodland creature that had draped herself in green gauze. On favored bushes there were buds of May. Alvaric said over and over to himself farewell to all these things. The cuckoo went on calling, and not for him. And then, as he pushed through a hedge into a field untended, there suddenly close before him in the field was, as his father had told, the frontier of twilight. It stretched across the fields in front of him, blue and dense like water, and things seen through it seemed misshapen and shining. He looked back once over the fields we know. The cuckoo went on calling unconcernedly. A small bird sang about its own affairs, and nothing seeming to answer or heed his farewells, Alvaric strode on boldly into those long masses of twilight. A man in a field not far was calling to horses. There were folk talking in a neighboring lane as Alvaric stepped into the rampart of twilight. At once, all these sounds grew dim, humming faintly as from a great distance. In a few strides, he was through and not a murmur at all came then from the fields we know. The fields through which he had come had suddenly ended. There was no trace of its hedges bright with new green. He looked back and the frontier seemed lowering, cloudy and smoky. He looked all around and saw no familiar thing. In the place of the beauty of May were the wonders and splendors of Elfland. The pale blue mountains stood august in their glory, shimmering and rippling in a golden light that seemed as though it rhythmically poured from the peaks and flooded all those slopes with breezes of gold. And below them, far off as yet, he saw going up all silver into the air, the spires of the palace only told of in song. He was on a plain on which the flowers were queer and the shape of the trees monstrous. He started at once toward the silver spires. To those who may have wisely kept their fancies within the boundary of the fields we know, it is difficult for me to tell of the land to which Alvaric had come, so that in their minds they can see that plain with its scattered trees 
and far off the dark wood out of which the palace of Elfland lifted those glittering spires, and above them and beyond them that serene range of mountains whose pinnacles took no color from any light we see. Yet it is for this very purpose that our fancies travel far, and if my reader, through fault of mind, fail to picture the peaks of Elfland, my fancy had better have stayed in the fields we know. Know then that in Elfland are colors more deep than are in our fields, and the very air there glows with so deep a lucency that all things seen there have something of the look of our trees and flowers in June reflected in water. And the color of Elfland, of which I despaired to tell, may yet be told, for we have hints of it here. The deep blue of the night in summer, just as the gloaming has gone. The pale blue of Venus flooding the evening with light. The deeps of lakes in the twilight. All these are hints of that color. And while our sunflowers carefully turn to the sun, some forefather of the rhododendrons must have turned a little towards Elfland so that some of that glory dwells with them to this day. And, above all, our painters have had many a glimpse of that country, so that sometimes, in pictures, we see a glamour too wonderful for our fields. It is a memory of theirs that intruded from some old glimpse of the pale blue mountains while they sat at easels painting the fields we know. So Alverick strode on through the luminous air of that land whose glimpses dimly remembered our inspirations here, and at once he felt less lonely. For there is a barrier in the fields we know, drawn sharply between men and all other life, so that if we be but a day away from our kind, we are lonely. But once across the boundary of twilight, and Alverick saw this barrier was down. Crows walking on the moor looked whimsically at him. All manner of little creatures peered curiously to see who was come from a quarter whence so few ever came, to see who went on a journey whence so few ever returned. For the king of Elfland guarded his daughter well, as Alverick knew although he knew not how. There was a merry sparkle of interest in all those little eyes and a look that might mean warning. There was perhaps less mystery here than on our side of the boundary of twilight, for nothing lurked or seemed to lurk beyond great bowls of oak, as in certain lights and seasons things may lurk in the fields we know. No strangeness hid on the far side of ridges, nothing haunted deep woods. Whatever might possibly lurk was clearly there to be seen, whatever strangeness might be was spread in full sight of the traveler. Whatever might haunt deep woods lived there in the open day. And so strong lay the enchantment deep over all that land that not only did beasts and men guess each other's meanings well, but there seemed to be an understanding even that reached from men to trees and from trees to men. Lonely pine trees that Alverick passed now and then on the moor, their trunks glowing always with the ruddy light that they had got by magic from some old sunset, seemed to stand with their branches akimbo and lean over a little to look at him. It seemed almost as though they had not always been trees before enchantment had overtaken them there. It seemed they would tell him something. But Alverick heeded no warnings either from beasts or trees and strode away toward the enchanted wood. Chapter Three the magical sword meets some of the swords of Elfland. When Alvaric came to the enchanted wood, the light in which Elfland glowed had neither grown nor dwindled, and he saw that it came from no radiance that shines on the fields we know, unless the wandering lights of wonderful moments that sometimes astonish our fields, and are gone the instant they come, are strayed over the border of Elfland by some momentary disorder of magic. Neither sun nor moon made the light of that enchanted day. A line of pine trees up which ivy climbed, as high as their lowering black foliage, stood like sentinels at the edge of the wood. The silver spires were shining, as though it were they that made all the azure glow in which Elfland swam. 
and Alverick having by now come far into Elfland, and being now before its capital palace, and knowing that Elfland guarded its mysteries well, drew his father's sword before he entered the wood. The other still hung on his back, slung in its new scabbard over his left shoulder. And the moment he passed by one of those guardian pine trees, the ivy that lived on it unfastened its tendrils and, rapidly letting itself down, came straight for Alverick and clutched at his throat. The long, thin sword of his father was just in time. Had it not been drawn, he would have scarcely got it out, so swift was the rush of the ivy. He cut tendril after tendril that grasped his limbs as ivy grasps old towers, and still more tendrils came for him until he severed its main stem between him and the tree. And as he was doing this, he heard a hissing rush behind him, and another had come down from another tree and was rushing at him with all its leaves spread out. The green thing looked wild and angry as it gripped his left shoulder as though it would hold on forever. But Alverick severed those tendrils with a blow of his sword and then fought with the rest, while the first one was still alive but now too short to reach him and was lashing its branches angrily on the ground. And soon, as the surprise of the attack was over and he had freed himself of the tendrils that had gripped him, Alverick stepped back until the ivy could not reach him, and he could still fight it with his long sword. The ivy crawled back then to lure Alverick on, and sprang at him when he followed it. But, terrible though the grip of ivy is, that was a good sharp sword, and very soon Alverick, all bruised though he was, had so lopped his assailant that it fled back up its tree. Then he stepped back and looked at the wood in the light of his new experience, choosing a way through. He saw at once that in the barrier of pine trees the two in front of him had had their ivy so shortened in the fight that if he went midway between the two, the ivy of neither would be able to reach him. He then stepped forward, but the moment he did so he noticed one of the pine trees moved closer to the other. He knew then that the time was come to draw his magical sword. So he returned his father's sword to the scabbard by his side and drew out the other over his shoulder and, going straight up to the tree that had moved, swept at the ivy as it sprang at him, and the ivy fell all at once to the ground, not lifeless but a heap of common ivy. And then he gave one blow to the trunk of the tree and a chip blew out, not larger than a common sword would have made, but the whole tree shuddered, and with that shudder disappeared at once a certain ominous look that the pine had had, and it stood there, an ordinary, unenchanted tree. Then he stepped on through the wood with his sword drawn. He had not gone many paces when he heard behind him a sound like a faint breeze in the treetops, yet no wind was blowing in that wood at all. He looked round, therefore, and saw that the pine trees were following him. They were coming slowly after him, keeping well out of the way of his sword, but to left and right they were gaining on him, so that he saw he was being gradually shut in by a crescent that grew thicker and thicker as it crowded amongst the trees that it met on the way and would soon crush him to death. Alverick saw at once that to turn back would be fatal and decided to push right on relying chiefly on speed, for his quick perception had already noticed something slow about the magic that swayed the wood, as though whoever controlled it were old or weary of magic or interrupted by other things. So he went straight ahead, hitting every tree in his way, whether enchanted or not, a blow with his magical sword, and the runes that ran in that metal from the other side of the sun were stronger than any spells that there were in the wood. Great oak trees with sinister boles drooped and lost all their enchantment as Alvaric flashed past them with a flick of that magical sword. He was marching faster than the clumsy pines, and soon he left in that weird and eerie wood a wake of trees that were wholly unenchanted, that stood there now without hint of romance or mystery even. And all of a sudden, he came from the gloom of the wood to the emerald glory of the Elf King's lawns. Again, we have hints of such things here, 
Imagine lawns of ours just emerging from night, flashing early lights from their dewdrops when all the stars have gone. Bordered with flowers that just begin to appear, their gentle colors all coming back after night, untrodden by any feet except the tiniest and wildest, shut off from the wind and the world by trees in whose fronds is still darkness. Picture these waiting for the birds to sing. There is almost a hint there sometimes of the glow of the lawns of Elfland, but then it passes so quickly that we can never be sure. More beautiful than aught our wonder guesses, more than our hearts have hoped, were the dewdrop lights and twilights in which these lawns glowed and shone. And we have another thing by which to hint of them, those seaweeds or sea mosses that drape Mediterranean rocks and shine out of blue-green water for gazers from dizzy cliffs. More like sea floors were these lawns than like any land of ours, for the air of Elfland is thus deep and blue. At the beauty of these lawns, Alveric stood gazing as they shone through twilight and dew, surrounded by the mauve and ruddy glory of the massed flowers of Elfland, beside which our sunsets pale and our orchids droop, and beyond them lay like night the magical wood. And jutting from that wood, with glittering portals all wide open to the lawns, with windows more blue than our sky on summer nights, as though built of starlight, shown that palace that may be only told of in song. As Alvaric stood there with his sword in his hand, at the wood's edge, scarcely breathing, with his eyes looking over the lawns at the chiefest glory of Elfland, through one of the portals alone came the king of Elfland's daughter. She walked dazzling to the lawns without seeing Alvaric. Her feet brushed through the dew and the heavy air, and gently pressed for an instant the emerald grass, which bent and rose, as our harebells when blue butterflies light and leave them, roaming carefree along the hills of chalk. And as she passed, he neither breathed nor moved, nor could have moved if those pines had still pursued him, but they stayed in the forest, not daring to touch those lawns. She wore a crown that seemed to be carved of great pale sapphires. She shone on those lawns and gardens like a dawn coming unaware out of long night on some planet nearer than us to the sun. And as she passed near Alberic, she suddenly turned her head, and her eyes opened in a little wonder. She had never before seen a man from the fields we know. And Alberic gazed in her eyes all speechless and powerless still, it was indeed the Princess Lirazel in her beauty, and then he saw that her crown was not of sapphires, but ice. Who are you? she said, and her voice had the music that, of earthly things, was most like ice in thousands of broken pieces rocked by a wind of spring upon lakes in some northern country. And he said, I come from the fields that are mapped and known. And then she sighed for a moment for those fields, for she had heard how life beautifully passes there, and how there are always in those fields young generations, and she thought of the changing seasons and children and age of which elfin minstrels had sung when they told of earth. And when he saw her sigh for the fields we know, he told her somewhat of that land whence he had come. And she questioned him further, and soon he was telling her tales of his home and the Vale of Earl. And she wondered to hear of it, and asked him many questions more. And then he told her all that he knew of Earth, not presuming to tell Earth's story from what his own eyes had seen in his bare score of years, but telling those tales and fables of the ways of beasts and men that the folk of Earl had drawn out of the ages, and which their elders told by the fire at evening when children asked of what happened long ago. Thus, on the edge of those lawns, whose miraculous glory was framed by flowers we have never known, with the magical wood behind them, and that palace shining near which may only be told of in song, they spoke of the simple wisdom of old men and old women, telling of harvests and the blossoming of roses in May, of when to plant in gardens, of what wild animals knew, how to heal, how to sow, how to thatch, and of which of the winds and what seasons blow over the fields we know. And then, 
There appeared those knights who guard that palace lest any should come through the enchanted wood. Four of them, they came shining over the lawns in armor, their faces not to be seen. In all the enchanted centuries of their lives, they had not dared to dream of the princess. They had never bared their faces when they knelt armed before her. Yet they had sworn an oath of dreadful words that no man else should ever speak with her if one should come through the enchanted wood. With this oath now on their lips, they marched towards Alveric. Lyrazel looked at them sorrowfully, yet could not halt them, for they came by command of her father, which she could not avert. And well she knew that her father might not recall his command, for he had uttered it ages ago at the bidding of fate. Alveric looked at their armor, which seemed to be brighter than any metal of ours, and though it came from one of those buttresses near, which are only told of in song, then he went towards them, drawing his father's sword, or he thought to drive its slender point through some joints of the armor. The other he put in his left hand. As the first knight struck, Alveric parried and stopped the blow, but there came a shock like lightning into his arm, and the sword flew from his hand, and he knew that no earthly sword could meet the weapons of Elfland, and took the magical sword in his right hand. With this he parried the strokes of the Princess Lyrazel's guard, for such these four knights were, having waited for this occasion through all the ages of Elfland, and no more shock came to him from any of those swords, but only a vibration in his own sword's metal that passed through it like a song, and a kind of glow that arose in it, reaching to Alveric's heart and cheering it. But as Alveric continued to parry the swift blows of the guard, that sword that was kin to the lightning grew weary of these defenses, for it had in its essence speed and desperate journeys. And lifting Alveric's hand along with it, it swept blows at the elvish knights, and the armor of Elfland could not hold it out. Thick and curious blood began to pour through rifts in the armor, and soon of that glittering company two were fallen. And Alveric, encouraged by the zeal of his sword, fought cheerily and soon overthrew another, so that only he and one of the guard remained, who seemed to have some stronger magic about him than had been given to his fallen comrades. And so it was, for when the elf king had first enchanted the guard, he had charmed this elvish soldier first of all, while all the wonder of his runes were new. And the soldier and his armor and his sword had something still of all this early magic about them, more potent than any inspirations of wizardry that had come later from his master's mind. Yet this knight, as Alveric soon was able to feel along his arm and his sword, had none of those three master runes of which the old witch had spoken when she made the sword on her hill. For these were preserved unuttered by the king of Elfland himself, with which to hedge his own presence. To have known of their existence, she must have flown by broom to Elfland and spoken secretly alone with the king. And the sword that had visited Earth from so far away smote like the falling of thunderbolts, and green sparks rose from the armor, and crimson as sword met sword, and thick elvish blood moved slowly from wide slits down the cuirass, and Lyrazel gazed in awe and wonder and love, and the combatants edged away fighting into the forest, and branches fell on them, hacked off by their fight, and the runes in Alveric's far-traveled sword exulted and roared at the elf knight, until in the dark of the wood, amongst branches severed from disenchanted trees, with a blow like that of a thunderbolt riving an oak tree, Alveric slew him. At that crash and at that silence, Lyrazel ran to his side. Quick, she said. For my father has three runes. She durst not speak of them. Whither, said Alberic, And she said, To the fields you know. 